Welcome to the Rare Books Department at the J. Willard Marriott Library, the University of Utah. My name is Louise Poulton. The 13 books presented in this virtual visit to the Rare Books Department represent brief moments in the shift from the European Renaissance to the budding and building of Western nation states in the 17th through the early 20th centuries. The scientific, political, and literary pursuits of knowledge during this period had consequences felt throughout the world and still today. These intellectual endeavors attempted to understand, through observation, evidence, and logic, truth regarding the nature of the universe and the nature of humanity within that universe. Issues such as the divine right of kings, anarchy, law, human behavior, the distinction between body and mind, heredity, faith, experience, environment, slavery, wealth, corruption, creation, ambition, independence, were tackled by the authors introduced here. Each of these works, in its own way, is a voice of protest. Born in Pisa in 1564, Galileo studied medicine, mathematics, and philosophy. In 1592, he was appointed to the chair of mathematics in Padua. His early researches were mainly on motion, particularly of falling bodies, but he became especially interested in astronomy. He developed a new type of telescope and was the first European to make systematic observations of the heavens by means of a telescope. Galileo was a deeply religious man, but much of his work proved the theories of Copernicus, contradicting both Holy Scripture and sacred tradition. The Roman Catholic Church, concerned about dissension that might weaken its struggle with Protestantism, had placed an injunction not to hold or defend Copernican doctrine. Galileo ignored the injunction with the publication of Dialogo. Galileo's Dialogo is a scientific and philosophical affirmation of the Copernican heliocentric theory over the Earth-centered Ptolemaic theory of the solar system. The book was released in February 1632 in a printing of 1,000 copies. This printing sold out before the end of September. Galileo deliberately chose to write this work in his vernacular Italian rather than scholarly Latin in order to reach a mass audience. His attack on conventional astronomy made Galileo a threat to the authority of the Catholic Church. The work took the form of a dialogue between Simplicio, a supporter of Aristotle and Ptolemy, Segredo, a layman, and Salviati, a proponent of Copernicus's ideas. A meeting of the minds then between Aristotle, Ptolemy, and Copernicus. The frontispiece depicts a seemingly innocent street corner conversation, the three of them just talking, no big deal. But this book brought Galileo before the Roman Inquisition in 1633. In 1616, he had already been denounced to the Roman Inquisition. After the publication of Dialogo, he was interrogated three times, charged with heresy, and threatened with torture. He was forced to recant his views. He stated that he had reread his Dialogo and could see how it was mistakenly seen as a defense of Copernicus. He was put under permanent house arrest and directed to refrain from raising the Copernican question again. Dialogo was officially suppressed by the Inquisition in 1633 and placed on the index of prohibited books, where it kept company with the works of Copernicus and Kepler and remained in the index until 1835. Still, Galileo's theories and arguments continued to spread, although for most people at the time, 
it was difficult to distinguish between, say, sorcery and science. The guarantee that the earth did, in fact, revolve around the sun was no easier to comprehend than the Aristotelian assurance that it did not. With Copernicus and Galileo, the comprehensible closed universe of the Greek and Christian worlds vanished, replaced with the sense that earth and man were wanderers through the dark infinitude of space. Humans were no longer at the center of the universe, and God was no longer in a specific place. Thomas Hobson's Leviathan was the product of troubled times in England. Hobbes was a royalist who supported the Stuart kings, the English Civil War, the Puritan Revolution. The general conflict between royalists and republicans spurred Hobbes to write Le Leviathan. Banned as heretical and seditious, and ordered to be burnt by the English licensers almost immediately after this first edition was released, Leviathan was, nonetheless, reprinted in numerous spurious editions. In 1703, it was placed on the index of prohibited books. For all that, the work was extremely influential. Hobbes rejected the prevalent theory of divine right of kings and supported the idea of a social contract which each individual made with all others. He believed that the power of the sovereign was subject to certain limits. However, he defended absolutism, the predominant form of government in the 17th and 18th centuries and unpopular even in his day as a necessary antidote to anarchy. The individual, except to save his own life, should always submit to the state. Law is preferable to anarchy. Hobbes supported absolute monarchy on this premise. But Hobbes's logic was not appreciated by the monarchists of his day. He demolished their claim to divine right and dismissed appeals to tradition and personal sentiment. Hobbes reasoned that man's aggressive tendencies had made life intolerable and argued that individuals fearing each other must turn over any rights to the state as a means of securing order. Therefore, people are bound to obey the absolute dictates of their ruler. This was Hobbes's version of a social contract. Hobbes opened up a study of human behavior and provided a basis for the modern authoritarian state. French mathematicians Pierre Gassendi attacked astrology. He examined Nostradamus's genitures of notables, comparing them to the lives they actually led. For one man, he pointed out that Nostradamus had predicted a long beard, discolored teeth, and a bowed back. The gentleman, in fact, kept his jaw clean-shaven, his teeth white, and his back erect to the end of his life. Gassendi engaged in a public feud with a physician, alchemist, astrologist, cosmologist, and Kabbalist named Robert Flood. Compiling facts against unsubstantiated claims such as these, those made by Nostradamus, Flood, and others, Gassendi exposed the systematic flaws in astrological practice. A devout and pious priest, Gassendi found truth in mathematics. He wrote, if we know anything, we know it by mathematics. Gassendi believed that everything was composed of basic units of matter called atoms, a material theory he got from his favorite ancient sources, Epicurus and Lucretius. Gassendi used, in particular, the work of the 4th century Greek philosopher Epicurus to argue against the, Arist the Aristotelian worldview and to counter the philosophical views of René Descartes. I walk, therefore I am, was Gassendi's answer to Descartes' I think, therefore I am. Using the atomist worldview as his foundation, Gassendi developed a philosophy of the physical. 
as an explanation for Tarantism, for instance, Gassendi theorized that music pushed motion onto the blood, which then pushed motion onto muscles and nerves, resulting in the wild movements that looked like a frenzied dance, which then caused particles of poison to be broken down into ineffectual bits. His work as an astronomer was more successful. Gassendi used telescope lenses provided to him by Galileo and made numerous astronomical observations that helped establish the validity of Kepler's laws of planetary motion. In 1631, one year before the publication of Galileo's Dialogo, Gassendi, at the suggestion of Kepler, published an open letter to the astronomers of Europe asking them to observe the transit of Mercury across the sun due to take place in November of that year. The reports he received and his conclusions based on those reports provided strong evidence for the Copernican model. This is the first edition of a collection of three works by Gassendi, Galileo, and Kepler, and the first publication in England of all three works. Gassendi's Institutio Astronomica was first published in 1647. This is the second edition of that work. It was divided into three sections. The first discussed the theory of the spheres, the second described astronomical theory, and the third discussed the conflicting ideas of Tycho Brahe and Copernicus. The work was used as a textbook particularly in English universities, for years. Along with Gassendi's work was Galileo's Sidereus Nuncius, or Starry Messenger, first published in 1610. This is the third edition of that work and the first English edition of any of Galileo's works. Starry Messenger announced Galileo's first observations through a telescope he had developed in 1609. He discovered Jupiter's four moons with this telescope. He observed the Earth's moon as a spherical solid body complete with mountains and valleys, contradicting the traditional belief that the moon was crystalline. He observed thousands of stars hidden from the naked eye. With these observations, Galileo accepted and defended the Copernican theory. Also included in this publication is the second edition of Johannes Kepler's Dioptris, first published in 1611, six months after he received a copy of Galileo's Starry Messenger. Kepler explained the manufacture and workings of the telescope, a necessary treatise in argument for acceptance of what the telescope revealed. Published together, these works provided a profound triage of compelling argument for an authority other than religion in understanding the universe. When publication outlets are imperiled, speculative freedom is endangered. De Hominy is a work on human physiology the earliest in a series of works by French mathematician and philosopher René Descartes that set the agenda for the distinction between mind and body. It is the first European textbook on physiology and the first description of voluntary action preceding the modern concept of reflex action. Descartes held back on the publication of this work after hearing of the condemnation of Galileo by the Inquisition as a result, this work was published well after the author's death. It was never intended to stand as a work on its own, but to be part of a larger work, Le Monde. With the exception of two fi figures attributed to Descartes, the editor of this posthumous publication, Florentino Scheuil, created his own copper plate engravings to illustrate his translation. The plates include a drawing incorporating William Harvey's ideas on the paths of blood circulation through the heart to the brain 
and to human uh, male reproductive organs, and a full page engraving of the heart, complete with paper flaps that can be folded back to uncover inner chambers. Seven more engravings depict the brain from various angles and at various stages of dissection. These were certainly the best drawings of the brain to date. In one, a paper pineal gland can be lifted to reveal the openings to blood vessels and nerve passages that lie beneath. These mechanical engineered paper illustrations engage the reader's sense of touch and enhance the reader's insight into Descartes' argument that the body itself is mechanical, separate from the soul. Descartes believed that the relationship of the soul to the body was mediated by the brain and nervous system. Influenced by engineering feats of his time, he developed a hydromechanical theory of how the soul contributed to the contraction of muscle through interme intermediary organs such as the pineal gland. He explained how the body received, through the nervous system, signals that produced sensation. Descartes said, the body is nothing other than a statue or earthen machine that God forms purposefully to resemble us as much as possible. For Descartes, much of human behavior could be explained by mechanical responses rather than by any promptings of the soul. Although Copernicus, Galileo, and Kepler had shown the way by describing the phenomena they discovered, they observed, Isaac Newton, born in the year that Galileo died, explained the underlying universal laws of these phenomena. Newton's theories overthrew the subjective interpretations of nature that had dominated science and natural philosophy since the time of Aristotle. His system of the universe would remain unchallenged until Einstein published his theory of relativity. By age 43, Newton had invented calculus, broken white light into its component colors, and built a tabletop-sized reflecting telescope more powerful than any other in his day, and whose design is still used in our day. When he was 43, he published this book. Isaac Newton's Principia, a rigorous mathematical proof of the Copernican system, gave us the three laws of motion, defined gravity, and provided the precise mathematical equations by which it could be measured. The book introduced the notion of absolute space and time, later undone by Einstein's theories of special and general relativity. It explained the movement of the planets, as well as, as of comets, the moon, and the tides by virtue of the single universal gravitational force, and the same laws of motion applied to moving objects on Earth. Edmund Halley of Halley's Comet fame was instrumental in getting Principia into print. Halley wheedled, flattered, and bullied Newton, a recluse, into preparing his manuscript. Halley paid the cost of printing out of his own pocket. It is likely that no more than 300 copies of the first edition were printed, yet this book profoundly changed the way we see the world. Poet Alexander Pope wrote, nature and nature's laws lay hid in night. God said, let Newton be, and all was light. Poet William Wordsworth wrote of Newton, forever voyaging through strange seas of thought alone. Albert Einstein said that Newton determined the course of Western thought, research, and practice like no one else before or since. Wilhelm Leibniz, who argued that it was he who had invented calculus, admired Newton's math, but was appalled by his fascination with alchemy. For the rest of his life, Newton pursued an understanding of the sacred and the notion of a pristine original faith. His alchemical experiments, much of his thinking really, was aimed at getting to the bottom of the force, the something 
that appear to be at work in natural processes. Newton wasn't the only one metaphysically confused by his own work. After Principia, God seemed to be a master mathematician who created the world in accordance with natural laws. He surely could not be expected to spoil his own handiwork or admit imperfections by intervening with a miracle. The foundation work of English political theory, this work is also fundamental in the history of psychology. John Locke's essay was the first modern attempt to analyze the whole range of human knowledge. He applied an Anglo-Saxon penchant for facts to the study of philosophy and concluded that most knowledge emanated from experience. This theory challenged a long established conviction that knowledge was innate or revealed. Descartes, for instance, held that some ideas are implanted by God, that the human mind was already imprinted at birth. Instead, Locke likened the mind at birth to white paper, void of all characters without ideas. Every person is born with a blank mind. Experience, not heredity, not divinity, marked the paper. Experience included immediate perceptions and the sorting and arranging of those perceptions. These processes enable the individual to understand and control the world around them. Knowledge derived from environment, the external world, molded prejudice. Locke's essay was 20 years in the making. Although Locke was uncertain about the book's reception, it quickly ran to several editions. Locke's theories were continued by David Hume and Immanuel Kant in the 18th century. From 1763 to 1776, Locke was especially popular reading among English colonists in North America. Locke's theories suited the 18th century view that people are shaped by their environment. According to Locke, if the correct environment is provided, individuals will have correct ideas. The first edition of Locke's essay was printed by a woman, Elizabeth Holt, was most likely a widow who carried on her husband's printing business after his death in 1671. In 1688, she was ordered to lay down the trade of printing, part of growing strict control of the printing trade. This may have been one of her last printing jobs. Until the publication of this book, Montesquieu had been mostly recognized for his wit, based in large part on his first work published in 1721, Persian Letters. Montesquieu published the book anonymously, but it was no secret who wrote it. The work criticized the Catholic Church and the French monarchy. Montesquieu was among the first to voice dissatisfaction with the French government. He wanted nobility, Montesquieu belonged to this class, to play a more active role in it, and argued that good government required separation between legislative, executive, and judicial functions. He attacked traditional religion, advocated religious tolerance, and denounced slavery. We have, by the way, the first edition of Persian Letters in its English translation. This book, Consideration, drew attention to Montesquieu as a major writer and philosopher. It is his first published essay of political philosophy. The first seven of the 27 chapters detail the greatness of the ancient Romans, from their beginnings as a crude people to their ascendancy as a physical and intellectual might of the world. The ancient Romans loved liberty, discipline, public discussion, the quality of citizens under the law, and religious toler tolerance. The downfall of the Roman Empire, Montesquieu wrote, arrived with the decay of morals due to excessive wealth and its corruption of the ruling classes, creating inequalities in both wealth and power and resulting in little focus by the powerful on the common good. The work, like Persian letters, 
was first published anonymously. This first, first issue contains a number of phrases and notes which were considered dangerous and were suppressed in the second issue. Still witty, Montesquieu included a footnote regarding Charles I and James II of England, stating that if their religion had permitted them to take their own lives, the former would have avoided une telle mort, such a death, and the latter une telle vie, such a life. Like Galileo a century before, writers needed to be careful. In Spirit of the Laws, a comparative study of governments, Montesquieu claimed to have found the secret of Britain's success in maintaining a stable government. He argued that forms of political and social institutions varied, dependent upon conditions unique to different countries. Climate, soil, size, customs, and traditions all played a part in the type of government a nation might have. He distinguished three basic kinds of governments. Republics, suitable for small states and based on citizen involvement. Monarchy, appropriate for middle-sized states and grounded in the ruling class's adherence to the law. And despotism, dependent on fear to inspire obedience. He considered that the power of any state could be separated into three main parts, a legislative power to make the laws, an executive power to enforce them, and a judicial power to judge when the laws had been broken. If all of these powers were concentrated in one body, the result was tyranny. If they were separated, then freedom was protected because the misuse of power by one branch of government would be canceled by the other two branches. Spirit of the Laws, first published in French in 1748 and translated two years later into English, was read by Benjamin Franklin, James Madison, John Adams, Alexander Hamilton, and Thomas Jefferson, who incorporated its principles into their proposed constitution. Following Montesquieu's principle of separation of powers, the Constitution provided a system of checks and balances, wherein the central government was divided into three branches, each with the ability to check the functioning of the others. Although written as expedient political propaganda for the purpose of supporting New York State's ratification of the Constitution, the essays of the Federalists were recognized for their brilliant explanation and commentary on the new Republican Charter. The use of the Federalists as a tool for interpreting the Constitution has continued to the present day. The Federalist is the fundamental document left by the framers of the Constitution as a guide to their philosophy and intentions. Alexander Hamilton, the illegitimate son of a Scottish aristocrat and a woman divorced by her husband for adultery was the principal force behind the ratification pamphlets. The Federalist revealed Hamilton as one of the chief political thinkers in the Republican, but he enlisted fellow New Yorker John Jay and Virginian James Madison as co-authors. The individuals responsible for each essay is not clear. The first essay by Publius, the pen name for all three authors, appeared in an October 1787 issue of the Independent Journal, and all or some of the sub subsequent essays were also printed in the New York Packet, the Daily Advertiser, and the New York Journal, assuring broad readership. The first 36 Federalist essays were collected and published by the McLean Brothers in March 1788 and the final 49, along with the text of the Constitution, followed in a second volume in May. The last essays were printed in book form before they appeared in newspapers. In all, the essays represent one of the most important American contributions to political theory. George Washington had a copy of the Federalist, which he inscribed. In January 1990, his copy was bought in New York for about one and a half million dollars. In its day, however, the publication was not a success. Of the 500 copies printed, 
fifty were purchased by Hamilton and sent to Virginia. The sale of the rest was poor. The publishers complained in October 1788, long after New York had ratified the Constitution, that they still had several hundred copies unsold. Despite the poor sales of the first edition, The Federalist was published again and nearly continuously to the present day. The fifth edition of The Federalist contains an appendix of the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution of the United States with amendments not found in the fourth edition. The Philadelphia imprint contains revisions by Madison along with his claims of authorship of some of the essays previously attributed to uh, uh, Hamilton. Our copy is a gift from Dr. Ronald Rubin. It contains full page engraved portraits of Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay. Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley's Frankenstein was first published anonymously in 1818 in an edition of 500 copies. The anonymity here was not a matter of dangerous religious or political rhetoric, but because it was written by a woman. The novel had originally been rejected by Percy Bysshe Shelley's publisher and Lord Byron's publisher. The first edition contained a preface written by Percy Bysshe Shelley and a dedication to Mary Shelley's father, philosopher William Godwin. The second edition was released in 1823 with Mary Shelley's name as author. The third printing was published as part of Bentley's Standard Novels and also includes other stories by Shelley. This edition included many revisions. Shelley wrote the majority of Frankenstein during the summer of 1816 while vacationing in Switzerland with her friends, her future husband, Percy Bysshe Shelley among them and completed the work in 1817. She was 20 years old when the story was first published a year later. In the introduction to the third edition, Shelley wrote, in the summer of 1816, we visited Switzerland and became neighbors of Lord Byron. It proved a wet, ungenial summer and incessant rain often confined us for days to the house. Some volumes of ghost stories translated from the German into French fell into our hands. We will each write a ghost story, said Lord Byron. She described a conversation between Lord Byron and Percy Shelley concerning galvanism, the contraction, contraction of the muscle when stimulated by electric current, during which the question arose as to whether a creature might, she wrote, be manufactured, brought together, and endued with vital warmth through this process. Her participation in this discussion led to a sleepless night and acted as the catalyst for the creation of the story. One other probable source for the foundation of Mary Shelley's story exists. Traveling along Germany's Rhine River in 1814, she stopped at the city of Gershon. 10 miles from the city was Frankenstein Castle, where two centuries earlier, an alchemist had engaged in experiments and allegedly exhumed bodies to use for conducting medical research. It is possible that Mary Shelley had heard the tale told by the Grimm brothers Grimm about the alchemist Johann Conrad Dippel's accidental creation of a monster when one of the bodies under study reanimated after being struck by lightning. Frankenstein is the story of an ambitious scientist named Victor Frankenstein, who discovers a technique to impart life to non-living matter. Using large body parts due to the difficulty of manipulating small ones, Victor creates an eight foot tall monster with yellow eyes and skin that barely conceals the blood veins beneath. The young scientist is severely disappointed with this creation's grotesqueness and abandons it, causing it to suffer torment and ridicule. After some months, the, creation, the creature finds the scientist in the mountains, 
where he has fled out of guilt and begs his creator to take him in. Frankenstein refuses. The creature swears vengeance on his creator for bringing him into a world that hates him and returns to the Frankenstein family estate where he murders the scientist's brother. The creature again confronts the scientist and demands that he produce a wife for it. Frankenstein, afraid for the safety of his family and friends, agrees, but after beginning that work becomes increasingly concerned that the creature will spawn a new race of monsters. The scientist reverses his decision and destroys his own work. Not long after this, Frankenstein marries and the creature murders his wife. Frankenstein chases the creature to the North Pole. He is found by a crew of explorers. Dying of hyperthermia, Frankenstein relates his story to the crew's captain and then dies. The captain sees the creature on the ship, mourning the death of his creator. The creature tells the captain that Frankenstein's death has not brought him peace, rather it has left him completely alone. The creature then vows to commit suicide so that no one will ever know of its existence. The captain watches as the creature drifts away on an ice raft, never to be seen again. As Frankenstein dies from his overexposure to the harsh environment of the North Pole, he warns the captain against overambition. This warning plays a role in the captain's decision to not continue his scientific expedition and possibly saves the lives of himself and his crew. Embraced today as a precursor of the modern environmentalist movement, Walden is one of the most celebrated examples of American individualism and self-reliance. Henry David Thoreau's writing emphasizes an appreciation of nature for itself rather than as a resource to be exploited, a sharp departure from the prevailing economic and religious views of the period. Thoreau set an American literary standard by refusing to affirm on faith what could not be backed up by experience. A nonconformist, Thoreau distrusted the work of the reformers of the day and meant to keep himself free of their antics. He balked at bureaucracy and industrialization. He kept to a simple lifestyle, preferring to support himself by the labor of his own hands. His advice was to simplify one's private life along with one's government, always a threat to independence. But his independence led him to speak out actively against whatever he regarded as wrong. Six years after the publication of this book, Thoreau was one of several Northern literati who championed John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry in Virginia in an attempt to trigger a slave rebellion. The stance was very unpopular. Thoreau condemned the institution of slavery, if for nothing else than its reflection of American materialism. He would die before the United States ended slavery with the Civil War. His work was nearly ignored by his own generation, which, ironically, dismissed him as an impractical reformer. A modest 2,000 copies of the first edition of Walden were printed. Black poet County Cullen, the son of a Methodist preacher, was a mild and gentle voice of protest. He was conservative in his taste in poetry and in his writing of it. County Cullen selected the work of 38 poets to, as he put it, bring together a miscellany of deeply appreciated but scattered verse. The collection includes Paul Lawrence Dunbar, often credited as the first black poet to make a deep and lasting impression on the literary world, James Weldon Johnson, the author of what is referred to now as the Black National Anthem, W.E.B. Du Bois, Jesse Fawcett, Sterling A. Brown, Arna Bonton, Langston Hughes, and Cullen's own work. The poets were all known within the literary world. In his introduction to the anthology, Cullen wrote, this country's Negro writers may here and there 
turn some singular facet toward the literary sun. But in the main, since there is also the heritage of the English language, their work will not present any serious aberration from the poetic tendencies of the time. For Cullen, the color of his skin and the subjugated status it brought him nearly 100 years after the end of slavery in the United States was secondary. He was criticized at the time for this and is today. Still, the themes in his poetry reflect struggles with racism. He expresses bewilderment, if not indignity, at racial oppression, as his poem, Yet Do I Marvel, strikes at so eloquently. Langston Hughes, whom Cullen included in this anthology, on the other hand, defined himself as a black poet and found his affinity within the spirituals and blues of black culture. Hughes was of mixed race, including white and American Indian. Perhaps partly because of this, he found racism even more profoundly absurd than it surely is. Hughes wrote in 1959, Well, I like to eat, sleep, drink, and be in love. I like to work, read, learn, and understand life. I like a pipe for a Christmas present, or records, Bessie, Bach, or Bach. I guess being colored doesn't make me not like the same things other folks like, who are other races. So will my page be colored that I write? Being me, it will not be white, but it will be a part of you, instructor. You are white, yet a part of me, as I am a part of you. That's American. Sometimes, perhaps, you don't want to be a part of me, nor do I often want to be a part of you. But we are, that's true. As I learn from you, or I guess you learn from me, although you're older and white, and somewhat more free. To learn more about Rare Books, its collections and services, please subscribe to our blog, Open Book, view our digital exhibitions, view our website where you can find more virtual lectures, and visit us in the Special Collections Reference and Reading Rooms on level four of the Marriott Library. Thank you.